Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Luke Bible Study with Pastor Robert. We hope that you dive deeply into Scripture as you draw nearer to God. Thanks for joining us, and have a great study. So everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming out for the final study of uh, our Luke tonight. We're in the second half of Luke chapter 24. And let's make sure our Bibles are open to there. It's just a wonderful, wonderful conclusion to the nine-month study that we've been doing in this precious gospel, uh, Luke chapter 24. Of course, we ended last week in the middle of the Emmaus disciple um, uh, story, which is uniquely recorded only by Luke. Um, So hopefully you're remembering the first half of that. And tonight we, we look at the second half of that. And we're asking for one of our friends here to be our reader of the text. We're starting at verse 25 to the, here, here's a volunteer. So we'll uh, give our attention to the reading of the word. So your Bible, I trust is open to Luke 24 at verse 25. And we're going to read to the end of the chapter and then have a brief word of prayer. Then he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. (coughs) Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, And thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but carry the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Father, we give you all glory, honor, thanks, and praise for sending your son Jesus to us. It is through him as mediator that we have been reconnected with you. And if you had not sent him, and if he had not succeeded in his mission on the cross, we would still be at odds with you. 
but we are not. Mm. We can approach you directly. And so we give you a multitude of thanks beyond number for what you have accomplished and what your son, Jesus, accomplished. And now be with Pastor Robert tonight as he unpacks all these phrases for us one by one so we can understand them better as we end up our study of Luke. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. And he lived for a time among us and then was taken. And that's what we read in tonight's text. Thanks for that wonderful reading and opening blessing. Uh, we have the appearances and the ascension of Jesus as our title, the upper left corner of your outline tonight. And we're in the middle of the Emmaus disciple section, which really is, is a wonderful account. It's only recorded by Luke. Um, this is the third appearance then of Jesus' appearances uh, to people live post-resurrection. And of course, it's the same day. It's the first day of the week. The first appearance was to uh, Mary Magdalene. The second appearance to the other group of women that are mentioned in Holy Scripture. And uh, Jesus picked uh, for his opening witnesses uh, women who in Jewish rabbinic Law were not um, uh, uh, credible as witnesses, and that's who he turned to first. Praise the Lord. And then he turns to the men, and uh, the two Emmaus disciples are the third appearance that we're looking at uh, tonight. And, of course, it is a unique and wonderful text because we, the readers, understand more than they do. <laughs> well, we, we are able to enter in it because we know the end of the story. We know who the marvelous traveler is, and they don't. <laughs> And it's just marvelous to look down, you know, upon the account that is recorded for us by Luke um, and to know the end of the thing. So uh, we have several things we'll look at in this opening section of the Emmaus Disciples. First letter A in your outline, the scriptures um, that are, are mentioned here in the opening uh, verse 25. And, and the opening question is for us to kind of chew on right away here. Uh, what does foolish in the opening verse 25 what does foolish and slow of heart to believe all that the um, that the prophets had spoken? What, what does this say about the Emmaus disciples that Jesus in this opening verse of our text says how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe uh, the scriptures? What does this say about them? Let's chew on that for just a little bit while we're getting our spiritual juices flowing. I think they were still stuck in the belief that the Messiah would come and free them from all uh, human government. For, from, yeah, Romans, and and um, that, that seemed to be a prevalent expectation. Uh, that was in the nature of freedom. I mean, the Old Testament Psalms talk about, yeah, being freed from their enemies and so forth. So there certainly was enough scriptural precedence, right? Yeah. So anyone else? Foolish and slow of heart. That phrase is really unique. I'm hoping somebody will chew on that for a bit. What does that say about them? Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Here we go. They had head knowledge because they heard it. They knew it. They could recite the scriptures. Mm -hmm. They knew what Moses had said. Mm -hmm. However, they didn't believe it in their heart. Mm -hmm. So I think he's saying your heart's not converted. As they used to say about circumcision. Oh, okay. You're circumcised, but, but your heart, it's not in your heart. Your heart is far from me. Okay. All right. All right. So, yeah, that does seem to be a particular issue here that either, you know, we understand the expressions to be that it's indicating, right, the head knowledge, which is thorough enough, but they're, they're not yet converted. Uh, and other folks will argue, yep, they are converted, but they are lack foolish. They're lacking uh, the application of wisdom to the things that they've just seen, or they're not believing what they've just seen. So anyone else? Have you ever been called foolish before? Anybody? <laughs> Please. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus in the, in the, in the sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Yeah, so you can you can check that one out in this in, as a um, as a derogatory term 
Um, yeah, is that is that Matthew six? I think that's Matthew six in that particular section. <coughs> I'd have to look if that's the the same you know Greek word being translated here, but it does say something. It does say something about them. Now, if if you understand that this is kind of a picture that the di- Emmaus disciples are kind of a picture of of pre saved or unsaved people. Um, we know that, you know, they need a new heart. If uh, I put in your notes, um, Ezekiel 36, and God is the one who gives a new heart and he gives a new spirit. And by the way, you know, the disciples from the Ascension were only 10 days away then from the Holy Spirit descending upon them and, and them um, having his empowering. I put in your notes, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. It is interesting. Paul talks about that fact of unconverted people, right? No eye has seen what God has prepared. No ear has heard uh, what God has prepared, but God reveals it to us by his spirit. And uh, what else did I, I, I put down verse 14. Yeah. Man without the spirit of God doesn't accept the things of God because they are. So here the word foolish, they are foolish to him. And so, I mean, the connection of the words, it may be, you know, appropriate. It may not be because there are folks who argue very simply that these Emmaus disciples are, uh, you know, well, slow to believe. In other words, there there's belief, but there isn't the application of that belief um, at this given time. They've seen the evidence, the empirical evidence. They've seen it. And they've um, uh, um, they certainly are learned enough about what has occurred in the Passover weekend. Um, So I might have given you other scriptures like Ephesians 1 in your notes um, that having believed, they were marked with the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Um, And, and, you know, at times we ourselves as believers, you know, post Pentecost (laughs) are also in great need of the spirit's revelation on things. And there's, of course, the timing and the place that that God does open our eyes, even post Pentecost to um, truth and to understanding. So, uh, you know, there might be occasion to look at that, you know, both sides of that particular coin on this and what he was exactly saying to them, but they had the old Testament scripture in their hand. This is the exciting part. You look at verse 25, the opening verse, the, the object, the, the subject of what they were foolish about and slow to believe was what verse 25. What's the, the what are they slow to believe? The prophets. prophets. Yeah. So here's a singular term for for them, of course, a very well-known term, their Bible. I mean, the Old Testament Bible, and they're slow to believe it. Uh, So uh, these expressions that we're going to find now throughout the rest of our text, if you look at verse 27, um, there's another another designation of the Old Testament Bible uh, for these folks that are mentioned in verse 27. So you'll want to note these in your own notes or in your own Bible? What's the expression that uh, Jesus, uh, Luke records in verse 27 about the Old Testament? Beginning with Moses. And the there. So now all of a sudden it went from a, a singular term of the Old Testament to a dual term, Moses and the prophets. So this, this you could find throughout the New Testament. Now you go to verse 32. There's another term for the Old Testament Bible that these folks would have known and had in their hands. What's that term? And it's scripture, right? This is the holy writings, the grapha. This is the holy writings, all of it, right? The Old Testament is all inspired. Even your most favorite book, which is your most favorite book of the Old Testament, which is so, Le- great Leviticus. That's exactly what I was hoping for, right? See, so we, we can pick the familiar ones. Numbers, our favorite book of the Old Testament, right? And it's grapha. It's holy scripture. See, so there's a singular term like, uh, like the prophets was a singular term for the Old Testament Bible or the term scriptures. And then finally, verse 44 tonight gives us another really rich phrase for the Old Testament Bible that they had. (coughs) Give me the whole thing. And, okay, now it's three part. The Old Testament scripture is in three parts spoken of then as the law of Moses. Which books are those? Yep, the first five. And then the prophets. Now you got to name all of them right now. 
<laughs> there, there's a there's a great way to answer that. Yeah, the major or the minor or the you know the greater and lesser, and then the the psalms. So on your handout now, if you'll take the handout that the larger one that's stapled, and look to the last page, please. Look to the last page. You're going to see a chart that's like this. This verse is so precious, verse 44. This verse is so precious. You know, I just grabbed this, uh, you know, from whatever clip art I could find and gave it to you here. And, and my encouragement is, uh, you know, fold it in half and put it in the front cover of your Bible and keep it. So, so here, Jesus is speaking about the three-part division of the Old Testament uses the expression, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And the chart then that you have before and you are looking at it um, is uh, in three parts. And of course, the law or the Torah, that's uh, what we have here. The first five books, you see them listed there. And then the prophets. Now, this, this, by the way, as you see from the other box right above it, Old Testament books or the arrangement of the Hebrew Bible, our books in our English Bible are not in the order that they are in the Hebrew Bible. Now, the chart that you have shows the order of the books in a Hebrew Bible. That's what it shows. So the middle section of a Hebrew Bible is called the prophets. So the law of Moses, the prophets. And in the prophets, the Nevi'im which you see there, the Hebrew word is in parentheses. It's divided into former and latter prophets. So Joshua, Judges, Samuel, first and second, and Kings, first and second. Those in a Hebrew Bible are called prophets. You typically probably don't understand Samuel and Kings. as uh, Samuel is a prophet, of course. Kings, you might not think that way. The latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12. And of course, we've done a lot of Bible studies on those, have we not? The latter prophets, as far as time, former were earlier and latter were later in, in, uh, in uh, biblical history. And then the third section, the Psalms or the Kethuvim or the Hagiagrapha, the holy writings, are divided into three sections, letter A, B, and C. And you see the books that are divided there. In a Hebrew Bible, the last book in a Hebrew Bible is the book of Chronicles. And it's nowhere near the end of the Bible in your English Bible, you see. So a Hebrew Bible is arranged uh, quite differently that way. And Jesus, of course, is giving his authentication and his stamp of what is holy and what is scripture. Uh, what is written about him in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Okay. Yes. Would this be considered the chronological Bible then? Is that something else? Yeah, I don't have a chronological Bible, but the chronological Bible, as I understand it, is not this. It is actually assimilating everything, you know, from the given time period of the Old Testament and assimilating it in, into a harmony. Is, is that correct? Whoever has a chronological Bible? So this is, yeah. If you buy a chronological Bible, you're not getting this. It's it reads where like time frame as far as what yes. at what time in history. Yes. So Job shows up at a different time than what it does in either of the in our Bibles. Yeah. And it's yep. you know it's not a study Bible. Right. It's so the, an example Bible. would be all of the references to David as a boy and Goliath and working under Saul and then becoming king. And then, you know, so the books of Samuel and Kings, they merge those things together to make the storyline all straight. So you're not going to look for David in just Samuel. And then you jump to Kings that, that I think is the chronological Bible. Yeah. So it's somewhat akin to a harmony. Uh, like we've done the harmony of the gospels where they merge all four gospels into one storyline, you know, to this came first, this came second, as best as we could determine. Does, does anybody use a chronological Bible by chance? So you do, do you enjoy reading from it? You, you too. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you use in your daily reading through scripture. Okay. I've tried other ways and never made it. I never made it. <laughs> but when I bought my chronological Bible, okay. did it, sat down with it and did it. I'm, done it for huh. years now oh cool quite a few years good good great I'm, I'm still reading it book by book and chapter by chapter and i'm in i'm in micah now which is kind of fun so the minor prophets is really good 
So anyway, all of these designations of, of Holy Scripture are wonderful. Now, verse 27, let your eyes linger on a, a glorious verse 27. Um, and Jesus, of course, is explaining uh, to the Emmaus disciples, they, they need, you know, a, a moment of clarity, of course, to bring what they've already learned into their heart and mind. And, and this is the powerful part, right? Verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Uh, so here, the twofold division uh, being spoken of, of Holy Scripture, uh, law and prophets. He explained to them. Does everybody have the verb, verse 27, explained does everybody have that verb? No. Expounded. Expounded. That's very helpful. Any others? Interpreted is, is the proper or nail on the head term uh, for this right here, interpreted. In fact, this, this uh, he, uh, Greek word here explained is uh, where we get the English word hermeneutics. Hermeneutics. That's the Greek verb here, which means the interpretation of Scripture he interpreted the, the law of Moses and the prophets to them. And, and, and what the outcome of that was that they understood the law of Moses and the prophets of the Old Testament was talking about Jesus. That's the interpretation of the Old Testament text. It is teaching and showing Jesus. So verse 27, right? He hermeneuticed or he explained, or he expounded, or he interpreted to them what was said in all, notice the inclusiveness word, all the scriptures, all the scriptures. He didn't skip Leviticus. He didn't skip Numbers. He didn't skip 1 Samuel. All the scriptures concerning whom? Yes. Oh, glory, hallelujah. You do not need to wait to meet Jesus in the New Testament. You do not need to wait. The, Jesus is fully revealed to us in the glory, oftentimes, of picture or shadow or so forth. We get that. The writer of Hebrews says, yeah, now you've got Jesus in the reality because he came in the flesh. We, we get that. But, you know, uh, he's, he's all over. And wouldn't you have loved to listen in on his interpretation of the Old Testament text? Jesus explained and expounded to these two guys what was said about him in the Old Testament. And, and that's the glory of what, you know, we as New Testament believers need to do. We go to the Old Testament with our Jesus glasses on. And we're looking in our Old Testament reading for him. That, that's, the, that's the approach. That's the key to understanding Old Testament scripture is to be looking for Christ in the Old Testament because he himself said, this is where I am. You can find me here. So now at your table, question 1B, at your table, uh, brainstorm one messianic scripture or a scripture that refers to Jesus from each major part of the Old Testament. The three-part division of the Old Testament, again, three-part division, the law of Moses, first five books, the prophets, and the Psalms. So you, you may, of course, use this chart, but you may not use any of the rest of the pages for this exercise. I, I want you to start with what the Holy Spirit has already given you. So you may, that's why it's stapled. You may not use the rest of the chart. Um, so right now at your table, I'm asking each table to work together. Can you think of one passage from each of the three parts of the Old Testament that speak about Jesus? Go, go for it. Talk together, work together. Because you may say, I think this is a verse. I don't know where it is. And you'll work together and you'll write it down. So we give you a couple minutes. Okay, folks, just because of how much we've got left in the chapter, which is rich, we're going to keep going. But um, tell me, which, of the three sections, law, prophets, and psalms, which section did you come up with a prophetic verse first for Jesus? I'm curious. So you, you got one from the law. I heard the law over here. So, so every Okay, so this table came up with one from the prophets section first. 
How about for you? From the law section, that's interesting that we went to the law first. And which one was hard? Which section of the Old Testament was it hardest for you to brainstorm a, a, a prophecy of Jesus? Which one was hardest? None of them. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Anybody else? Which section you're scratching your head? I can't come up with one verse from that section. Anybody? Because they don't they don't want to say <laughs> they don't want to say which one. OK, so prophets. No, but it was one verse from the whole section prophets. It was hardest to come up with a verse about Jesus from the prophets. Do, do you know the point of the exercise? Read your Old Testament and look for Jesus. That's the point of this exercise. The section that you you couldn't come up with a verse about Jesus from that section of Scripture. This summer, my encouragement, read that section three, four, five, eight times over and be looking for Jesus, you know, in it. Now, there, of course, are Bibles that will help you to do that. But you've got better, you know, than a study Bible is the Holy Spirit. You've got the Holy Spirit. Trust him to lead you and guide you into all truth. That's the point. Now, the next part that we're going to do is one question, one C on your outline. Question one C. This is another work together section. Now I want all the tables to look for less familiar verses pointing to Jesus on the handout provided. That is to say, they're less familiar to you. So now what you're going to do is use the handout that I gave you, which is 351 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled by Jesus. So here you're not looking up any of the passages. We don't have time for that. But I want you at a, at a table to skim specific pages. So table number one is in front of me. You are only looking at pages one and two. Do you notice that the handout is, is numbered by pages? Okay. You're looking at pages one and two, pages three and four, pages five and six, pages seven and eight, uh, table six. You're looking at, oh, did I mess that up? One and two, three and four. Five and six. Table four is seven and eight. <laughs> table five is nine and ten. And table six is Zoom. Uh, you've got uh, page 11, the last page. So only look at your assigned pages. And now for a couple minutes at your table, just glance at some of the passages on your assigned page and start saying, wow, these are passages I didn't know were pointing to Jesus. Look for the less familiar passages. So do that out loud using just the, the worksheet. And it, that should be easy. Just make comments uh, to each other on less familiar prophetic passages about Jesus. Say, oh, I didn't know. Okay. Everybody got it? All right, folks, here we go. We'll have to come back together again. But maybe in just a tiny, itty-bitty way, I mean, you were in the shoes of the Emmaus disciples right now, and Jesus is walking along, and he's explaining the scriptures to you, and your eyes are seeing him in the Holy Bible that you use for the you know first time. Maybe you just were walking in the sandals of the Emmaus disciples, right? A passage that you hadn't seen before or known before, mm -hmm. and, and you've walked in it. And that's the exciting part. So uh, Jesus had finished explaining himself in the whole Bible, and he's ready to keep going. And it's nighttime, and they say, well, stay with us. I mean, wouldn't, I mean, with that kind of fellowship with someone who has opened the scripture for you, wouldn't you want that person to stay for dinner? And we're at part B of your outline, the meal and they say, stay with us. And this is where the hymn writer, Henry Light, 1847, he's a minister in England. He wrote the hymn, Abide With Me. Yeah. Fast falls the even tide, the darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. Mm -hmm. And from this text, it's just a powerful and, and beautiful hymn. And it reminds us also in your notes at verse 29, letter B, Revelation 320, that Jesus is at the door and he's knocking and if anybody opens the door he'll come in and eat with you see the same fellowship picture so brothers and sisters we know this but we have to be refreshed in it again every time i open the old testament scripture this is the holy word and jesus wants to come in and have a meal with me and with you in every page of leviticus and every page of ecclesiastes and every page of ezekiel or the books that are harder, 
He's knocking at the door and saying, come on, let's have a meal. And he'll talk with us about the scripture. That's the exciting part, you know, about this. And so it's interesting. Neither of the Emmaus disciples, verse 30, act as the host. Neither of them particularly act as the host. But Jesus, probably as the picture of a rabbi, who is obviously very instructive in the conversation about Holy Scripture with them, they yield to Jesus, who then takes the bread and gives thanks in their home, and then broke it and gave it to them. And this same uh, action of Christ uh, has already occurred twice in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it. Can you recall In the gospel, as we're closing, what other two times did this same event occur? The feeding of the the 5,000, same thing, and at, at the Passover meal, the Last Supper. And so this became the catalyst then for this occasion, this holy moment, verse 31, their eyes were opened. See, this is a divine passive. They were opened. And God who takes the veil off of eyesight, right? The God who originally took the veil off of my darkened heart, right? And opened my eyes to see Jesus. It's just such a glorious moment um, in verse 32. And then in that exact moment, he disappeared. But folks, there's something powerful about this. And verse 32, they're talking with themselves about antacids. <laughs> Weren't our hearts burning? Folks, this is a one-time expression in Holy Scripture. What are they describing about this experience? What are they describing with this phrase? Weren't our hearts burning within us? What is going on? okay this this obviously wonderful and mysterious moment it's not an everyday moment it's not an every time moment but the holy spirit who stirs and it, it the greek pictures this kind of a running or a flowing stream the burning of their hearts wasn't it burning when he opened the scripture to us and brothers and sisters that that's the same thing every time you open your holy scripture it, it, it can be the same thing, that our hearts are burning. The Holy Spirit is moving. He's churning within us. He's chiseling off hardness of my heart. He's chiseling off darkness of my eyes. He's chiseling off my doubt, my unbelief, right? And, and he's making my heart new again. First, obviously, at conversion, but all throughout my life right? That their hearts were burning. And the the hearts burning is also a divine passive. They didn't do this to themselves. I made my heart burn when I opened the scripture. No, no, no. It's God who is doing this action. It's a passive. Our hearts were burning. Somebody else created this stirring emotion and event within them. This is a holy moment. And of course, uh, you know, God is behind this, right? And so what else are they going to do? Just sit there all night? Somebody else has got to know we were with Jesus. Somebody else has got to know. Let her see the return trip. I mean, being seven miles approximately from Jerusalem, I think they had more energy and, and, and adrenaline by the Holy Spirit at this holy moment that the sandals may not have actually hit the ground very much in heading back. So, you know, they're doing a round trip in the same day, you know, the 14 miles they've left dejected thinking all hope for Israel is shot. And in this encounter and meeting with the resurrected Jesus, all things are made new again. So they return and verse 33, the 11 are there gathered together. And also some of the 72 So the little phrase, verse 33, those with them, verse 33, those with them, that's most likely some of the 72, you know, disciples went two by two. We saw that phrase um, earlier in verse nine of uh, chapter 24. And then the appearance, verse 34 to Simon 
And uh, I, I received some uh, emails from some folks who said there are some ministers who see this Simon as the second named person of the Emmaus disciples. Um, there are others of us who take it as a reference to Simon Peter, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 5, who is mentioned to have a meeting with Jesus as well, too. So I think you can research those uh, for yourself. But you know what? Ultimately, Jesus has already given us a gold mine. He disappeared from them because they already had in their hands, well, in a scroll, all that they need, folks, for life and godliness, all that they need, all that they need. And Jesus disappeared because you know what? He's giving emphasis to that which God has ordained, the Holy Scripture, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Don't miss a word of it. It's God breathed through these sacred writers. The world will never believe this from us. In fact, they'll think we've got heartburn like crazy because we say every word of this is given by God for my learning and for my instruction. Every word of Leviticus and Numbers, see? So in that sense, you do have the personal presence of Jesus Every time you open the book, you have the personal presence of Jesus. He did not need to bodily stay with those men because you've got him in this breathed out word. That's what he's saying to them. You've got everything you need for life and godliness. You're not getting chipped a bit that you as a brother and sister in Christ have not seen with physical eyes the resurrected Christ. You're not missing a thing. You've got him, and, uh, and that's the glory. So he disappeared because, you know what? They've got what they need, and now go and tell, right? Go and tell, which is, which is a marvelous thing. Oh, our scriptures should be tattered and torn, and your electronic devices should wear out because you've pressed the buttons too many times, right? Right? So the yellowed pages of a printed Bible and the, the broken buttons on a Kindle or whatever else, kind of a thing we use, right? But Christ is the key for understanding your Old Testament. Christ is the key to understanding the entirety of the Old Testament. So go with that key as as you read Old Testament scripture and look for him there, okay? Well, we've got to move on uh, for our timing's sake to part two. Everybody ready? Or or is the heartburn kind of overwhelming? It is kind of, I mean, for me, it's just the excitement of the word. It's like, boy, I mean, for them and and here still, the Holy Spirit stirs within us to these days. So part two, the Jerusalem disciples. See, the Emmaus disciples run all the way back to uh, Jerusalem. And now this will be the fifth overall appearance of Christ in his resurrected form to the uh, disciples who are going to be gathered in this uh, room and place. But we're looking now at verses 36 to 49. We'll ask you to jump in here with question 2A, verses 36 to 49. What does this appearance of Jesus to the gathered disciples and and the others who are with them, the Emmaus disciples, what does it tell us about his resurrected body? And, of course, by implication, then we'll kind of ask the same question about what it's going to say about our resurrected body. So you're skimming verses 36 through uh, 43, 44 in that ballpark and pick out some key things that we learn by Luke's uh, writing about the resurrected body of Jesus. So who will start us off? There's a hand there. Well, one that we are probably aren't going to look the same. I mean, there, uh, he stood up among them. It's not like, oh, look, Jesus is here now. Nobody comments to that. It's just instantly he's there. And uh, after he says, he said they're startled and frightened. Thought it was a spirit. Okay. So I would say, you know, if we think we're going to look like we look like now, the resurrected body, it's likely not. Okay. So there's some new newness, you know, to the resurrection of Christ. Yeah, that immediately there isn't isn't that immediate recognition. Okay. What else are you picking out? Here's a hand. Um, he didn't come through an open door or, or open window, so he must have come right through the walls. So his, he has this glorified body, which is not limited by physical. That's helpful. 
And that's that's why we understand as well, too, without any real specifics about the tomb. I mean, that he, he just passed through the the strips of linen. He passed through the walls of, of the tomb. Jesus didn't need to open the tomb to get out. You see? Not only that. Here he we go. The ability to travel instantly. <laughs> Which is kind of cool, isn't it? I mean, there's just an excitement about that, that we can't explore a whole lot through Holy Scripture at this point. You know, but but thinking about what that might be like in the new heavens and new earth. I mean, you know, when it's like, boy, I'd like to glorify God today in the uh, in the Grand Canyon. Boom. Mm. <laughs> he left the disciples instantly. He just disappeared. Yep. He get up and walk over to the door. And walk <laughs> yeah. The yeah. I, you know, please. When he was standing there, his body was not dead. The same person that that they knew of, and I myself, the person before the crucifixion, the same person standing there, the body he had, it rose from that. He's not dead no more. Yes. He was dead. Now he's alive. That's that's another interest to answer the question. So, you know, yes, this is this is the this is the, this is the issue of body. continuity. While there was the comment of discontinuity or a difference, here's continuity. I mean. The, the physical body which had mass to it is described how in the text? They can still touch Flesh it. And bones. There it is. Flesh and bones. There it is. Flesh and bones, which is verse 39. Folks, see, I mean, the whole thing of Jesus is just a phantom or a spirit or a ghost. No, no, no. These are the terms of concrete mass. Flesh and bones, which again, I mean, there are some folks who just misunderstand the glory of a resurrected body in new heavens and earth. You're not floating on a Charmin cloud like a spirit, for heaven's sakes. You will have mass, you will have flesh and bones as a body has. Yeah. And then, so there, there that thing about a, a real body that eats, right? And um, it's like, you know what? That's it, folks. Fish fry is it. That's all you're supposed to eat from here on in. (laughs) Okay, yes. So there are continuity and marks of the the crucifixion. Right. Right. So, so were, were those things healed at that point? You know, it, 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 it's mute because it doesn't say they were and it doesn't say they weren't. So just that he made the mention of the nail holes in the hands and, and feet. The hole inside. Yeah. But um, I read one person recently that said he's the only one in heaven who's going to have scars because it's going to remind us of what forever, what he did for yeah, us. Um, the rest um, of us are going to have perfect bodies. You know? the, the holiness... Yeah, of of that, because, I mean, the song of Revelation, yet a worthy is the lamb who was slain. See, we will worship Jesus for his redemptive work, and and the the marks are the sign of redemption paid, right? Paid for me. So uh, another uh, mark of the resurrected body? I just want to make a statement. I find it interesting that for how many decades... We see in our society a hunger for the supernatural in the arts, you know, movies, okay. yes. and, and this idea of coming, you know, transcendent life or whatever. You yeah, want. yeah. I just and, and just this find is, this is the truth. Just find it in Jesus. Yes. Here, here's here's you know the 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 change that we all desire, right? In a glorified body which will not have sin. You know, a mind which is not breaking down and knees that are not arthritic, right? Eyes that are not cataract. Uh, Just the glory of it all, right? The perfection of eyes that will see Jesus for who he is, right? Without the the dullness and the veil that's, you know, before us now. But this entire account, right? In fact, yeah, verse 39, touch me, touch me physical. I am physical, you see, there is continuity. It's, he's not just a spirit. That's false doctrine. Christ had a physical uh, resurrected body, which had the continuity of what, you know, was put on the cross and put into the grave. So, 
Well, he ate the fish, and I gave you that tiny little picture there of that, which, I mean, it is kind of an interesting, the Greek uh, word for fish, the Greek word for fish, he said, do you have anything to eat? And they had a piece of uh, cooked or broiled fish, which they gave to him. It's the word ichthus. So the Greek word for fish is ichthus, and this has become an acronym. Then the letters of the Greek word for fish, all you fishermen, the acronym of that then becomes a, uh, a declaration or a statement of Jesus Christ himself, thus the fish symbol. So the, um, the Yoda, the key, the theta, the epsilon, and the sigma are the letters of uh, the Greek word ichthus, and the I is for Jesus. That's the first letter of Jesus. The key is for Christ, um, the theta for uh, God the epsilon for son or God's son and the S sigma for savior. So that's in that tiny little chart that you have there. It's become, you know, an acronym. Then the fish, just the Greek word fish, ichthus, each letter being an acronym then for Jesus Christ, God's son and savior. Isn't that beautiful? Just from the Greek word fish. That's it. So I gave you the, that little picture on your outline there, right? So verse 44 in this section will continue to look at that section. This is great. Everything must be fulfilled um, that is written about me. And this is this precious word, which gives us the three-part division of the Old Testament. And Jesus says, everything must be fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, question 2B on your outline. How does the word must from verse 44 encourage your faith regarding unfulfilled Bible prophecies? oh good this is easy it must be fulfilled so your worksheets have you know dozens and dozens and dozens of passages some we knew i'm sure the ones you picked the first three that you picked in the first exercise you know they're on your list right some you knew right but you know others you know you say oh i didn't know that one i didn't know that one But now, you know, the ones that are fulfilled, right, the first coming of Christ, you know, all of his life, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, all of those being fulfilled. Doesn't that encourage your heart tonight? It has to, because there are some which says, I'm coming back. It's going to happen. It must happen. Do you see this? God has a divine plan, a divine plan for Jesus, a divine plan for you. It must be fulfilled. God is ruling from his throne on the universe. This is not chaos spinning out of control where you're trying to keep your head level. This this is God who is ruling, and it must be fulfilled. So I I hope that's a huge encouragement to you when you look at the word must, because it's, it's not random or chaos. It, it, it's under the careful uh, guise and direction and plan of God, right? All the days ordained for me, brothers and sisters, that's your must. All the days ordained for me, the psalmist says, were written where? In his book before, before one of them ever came to be. You're part of the divine must. Everything must be fulfilled as God is all. I mean, that's exciting, right? Doesn't that make your heart burn? <laughs> Don't take your tongues tonight. Just, just love Jesus more. Love Jesus more. Right? Just love him more. And I gave you in your notes, I mean, the fact that verse 45, just look at that lovingly. Verse 45, he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. How many times haven't you prayed that? That's the prayer of every believer every time a believer opens the Holy Word of God. God, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law, the psalmist says. And here Jesus is saying, you know, he opened their minds. God, that's my prayer. Please don't let me open scripture, you know, remotely and just, uh... oh, God, forgive me for treating your book. Like the Argus, you just skim it for a death notice. You look for something to do on Memorial Day weekend. Oh, no, brothers and sisters, this is it. The Holy Word, right? 
And God opened my eyes, and I want to see you. And Paul prayed. Do you remember how many years ago we did Ephesians? Paul prayed, if somebody will look it up, I'll, I'll rather have you look up Ephesians 1.17. Look this up, because we, we, we prayed this prayer years ago for our Ephesians study. Somebody let me know if you've got Ephesians 1.17. But here, read this and listen carefully. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Brothers, don't, isn't that your heart tonight? Jesus, I just want to know you better. I want to know you better. And knowing him better is the empowering of your life for his purposes. I mean, th- th- these trembling and bewildered disciples changed the world. Because they were convinced he's alive and they were willing to die for it. And every one of them did. They wouldn't have died if it was fake. If Christ wasn't alive, we just want to know him better. And the empower, the word of God is the power of God for the salvation of everybody who believes. So that's the exciting thing that we have before us. Now, verses 46 and 47, look at your Bible text, just uh, look at your Bible text. Here's a, a brief summary of Christian doctrine in verse 46, right? So he told them, this is what is written about me, the Christ. He will, number one, suffer. Number two, rise from the dead. Number three, when? Third day, which is the same day. Number four, verse 47. Oh, folks, that's how you enter into the picture. Repentance is what? Remember the the road sign that repentance pictures? U turn. You come with all the sin you've got. You've come with it all. You come with the whole baggage, the whole kit and caboodle, but you don't stay there. You U turn. Jesus will take any and every sin you've got, right? You name it, the worst of it out there today, he'll take it and he'll pay for it. But he asks you to turn. And number five, what does he promise? We're in verse 47. Oh, you're accepted by the beloved. He'll forgive it all. You are accepted fully by the Holy One. Forgiveness, which is promised in the new covenant, by the way. And uh, this should be um, gotten out how? Are we at number four, five, six? How should it go out? How should this word of repentance and forgiveness go out? It should be proclaimed or preached. And number seven, it should be done in whose name? See, always in Christ's name, folks. This is his mission. It's his word. And he's the central person of Holy Scripture. And where should it go? Yeah, which is which is a picture then of the Gentiles. And you should start, though, first with the Jews in Jerusalem. And Acts chapter one says the same thing, right? To the Jews first and then also to the Greeks or to the Gentiles, Romans and so forth. And then their job description, verse 48, changes. In a sense, they've moved on from the job description of being a disciple to now being a, verse 48. Oh, glory, hallelujah. You're a witness now. Right. You're a witness of these things. And then he says, you're not on your own. I'm taken off, but you're not on your own. Verse 49. Who is he sending? Right. He's sending the Holy Spirit. So 10 days from uh, the ascension. We had the ascension uh, last week, uh, a week ago, yesterday, a week ago, tomorrow, which makes Pentecost Sunday this Sunday. Uh, the celebration of Pentecost Sunday is this Sunday uh, in the, in the calendar, in the church year calendar. And you're to be witnesses. This is your new job. And the Holy spirit is going to empower you. And I just love the expression that in verse 49, how does the Holy spirit come on you? Stay in the city until you've been in, uh, endued or clothed. You, you are going in clothing is something that you, um, you, you wear uh, day and night. You, you are to, to wear the, the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit wherever you go, whatever you do. You're, you're clothed with him, right? He's going to indwell you and be with you. So wherever you go, that's how your witness is going to be empowered. 
Is that sweet? Who could have thought that up? Oh, gosh, I guess that was God's plan. I, I guess he really is, is working things out. And, and for his disciples, he was going to empower them with that, right? Well, the third section, let, let's go on to that section, part three, the ascension of Jesus um, now we're going to look up a few of these verses, but question three, a, what is the significance then of the ascension to the Christian faith? What is its significance? Do you want to, um, just draw on past learning? Because of course he, you know, blesses them and he goes up out of their sight, uh, which is, you know, kind of a cool thing, but anybody, maybe the Holy Spirit. Okay. And then the coming of the spirit. Once, once Jesus comes up, the spirit comes down. That's excellent. Conquered death. Um, yes, that he is alive. Yep, yep, the significance. Okay. Ascension. This one. So, what does that mean? Why do we care? Because he is our Lord and he has all authority. So, Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Therefore, I'm empowering you and clothing you. To carry on this mission. So the ascension, yeah, has to do with the lordship of Jesus, his being, you know, a uh, king. And and by the way, Mary's not there. His mother's not there. Sorry. Romans 8 talks about being conformed to the image of his son. Okay. And as he was ascended, we will be ascended. So see, that's a promise for us as well, too. Yep. And, and, and to be with him. Now, all of you just scatter over the verses I gave you under question 3A. Just scatter and, and hopefully everybody, you know, will scatter and pick one of the verses that's listed for you there. And then anything we haven't covered about the Ascension, we'll ask you to report on. So just go ahead and pick any singular verse under there, under question 3A in your outline. And if you have a verse that we have not discussed about the significance of the Ascension, we'll ask you to read the verse and tell us about it okay but you know this is a power it really is a wonderful doctrine the ascension and its personal meaning for us so yep just pick any one of the verses look it up and if if we've covered it already great if we haven't covered the verse we'll we'll give you a minute and we'll ask you to report on um, any verse we haven't covered as far as its significance for ascension and the Christian faith. So, yeah. Okay. Did everybody look up a verse or two? I hope so. Tell me of the, you know, we, we were just asking the question, right? What's the significance of the ascension to the Christian faith? Did you find a passage that maybe we didn't answer already, please? And tell us which one you looked up. Okay. Oh, wait, that was Daniel. He's gonna, Daniel, he's going to have an everlasting kingdom. Psalm 110, one, oh, same thing. It, they, they connect and relate to each other, of course. The, you know, the, uh, that God the Father is inviting Christ to sit at the right hand of the throne and to have an everlasting dominion and kingdom. So, you know, with the ascension, of course, this dominion is now in full force, right? The kingdom of God is in full force until he brings... Uh, it back down here at the second coming. All right. Excellent. What else? What other verse did you find about ascension? I don't have it. Never for this place. In, in uh, Hebrews, I mean, um, Corinthians 15, where you must reign until all enemies are brought under yeah. Excellent verse. And the last enemy to be brought under uh, dominion is death. Is so death. Right mm -hmm. hand Excellent. First Corinthians 15, you can add that to your verses 20. Uh, what 25 26 somewhere in that ballpark first corinthians 15 as far as the significance he must reign until all the enemies and folks that's what he's doing right now he is reigning he is reigning in the in the newest political ads that are coming out he is reigning in what's going on in the world and in your life as well too that's the significance of his ascension he, he's a ruling king uh what else did you find any other verses but thanks for adding a verse i didn't have Okay. Daniel 7 14. Uh, he's given dominion, glory, and kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. Mm. His kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Often that verse talks of the coronation of Christ, his coronation, his given dominion and authority. 
And when, when you see a world that is not uh, submitting to Christ, that means he's still working on their knees and their backs and everything else about them. He is. Okay. And then there was one here, please. John 14. Two. Oh. He says, I go to prepare a room for a place for you. Folks, do you know that's what Jesus is doing right now on your behalf? He's building a mansion for you right now with your name on it and decorating it with glory and with honor to him. That's what he's doing right now. That's the significance of the ascension. The promise of this, he says, yeah, I'm leaving, but this is what I'm going to do. Because he's so excited to bring you with him. So he's got to have a place for you to stay. Uh, What other verses did you find? Here's one. Romans 8.34, that he is risen. And he's alive with the the right hand of God. And it's also interceding for us. Which means what? That he's praying for us. (laughs) Yes. That's what he's doing right now. So, you know, I mean, if your life is a little bit chaotic or a little bit hurting or a little bit just, you know, broken right now, that's what he's working on and in. He is so fully engaged and involved in your doctor report and in your medical needs and in in your emotional state and in your personal care and, and commitment to him. He's engaged with that. He's interceding even for you. Hallelujah. Oh, my, do I need a Jesus who's on a throne interceding, right? And then I think I, did I see one over here? And then we'll squirrel back around again. Anybody here? A passage that we didn't cover yet? Table uh, uh, five or six? Yeah, five. Anybody? Did we cover anything? Otherwise, we're back to table six. Well, because of his great authority, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he has his Lord and the glory of the Father. Yeah. Every- yes, every folks, every one, right? So, you know what? I mean, the scoffing uh, for us in witnessing for Christ and in bidding people to come to Christ, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get a little hairy. It's going to get a little worse, yeah. right? The scoffing that's going to come to us because we say it is exclusive. There is no other name. There is no other way. This is it. He's the only one who has authority. So that's a powerful passage. Thank you for that. The reason why I thought it was huge that he entered the heaven as a high priest. Okay. So he entered into the most holy place. Yeah. Yeah. And and he entered with, with what? The blood of goats and bulls one time a year? See, so so that's also the significance of that passage is the full acceptance of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. The father says, yes, that was the full payment. So now you, Jesus, as the sacrifice and the priest, the high priest, you come and sit right here in the Holy of Holies. That's showing the full acceptance of what Christ did for me. Right. There's nothing more to do. There's no indulgence to pay. There, there, you know, there's there, there's no other work you have to do. There isn't any. Christ did the work, so that's powerful. How about here? I, was there one more hand here at table one? Psalm 68, 18, you ascended on high, meeting a host of captives in your train. You're receiving gifts among men, even men, even among the rebellion that the Lord God may dwell there. Okay, which is saying what about the time of the ascension now? He took others up to heaven again. Oh, but too bad he didn't take you right now, huh? Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the gifts, I thought you were pointing out the part of the gifts that he's endowed and empowered the believers with divine gifts, and you've all got them, and there's a place for you to minister and powerfully to do so because he's not left you as orphans, the gospel says, right? You are not left on your own. But he's empowered, and that's a cool thing. And then I'll come right over here. I wanted to make a comment about the prayer interceding. Interceding, thank you. Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Both. Then I realized, I knew it, and yet I hadn't put it together. Two two of the Godhead are interceding for us. How could it be any better to the Father? Right. Yeah, fully. Yeah, which, which becomes the two witnesses in heaven on behalf of whatever they are interceding for us here on earth. It cannot not be done, right? Please. Acts 1, 1 through 11. Okay. So specifically like 7, it says, He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Great. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, yeah. all the day of Samaria, yeah. to the ends of the earth. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're still reaching to the ends of the earth, aren't we? We're still reaching to that. Yeah. So um, we've got a great time with Dennis and Medea here right now. We, you know, we should be swamping them, Dennis and Medea, you know, to figure out what's our next move as a church regarding that mission. We, I mean, we should just be smothering them, the two of them, really. Um, when we've got missionaries who are, you know, uh, here right in our own midst at this particular time. And, and Amy will testify to that too. Is that this Sunday? Is that this Sunday, next Sunday, two Sundays. Yeah. Oh boy. Let's come alongside and figure out what's, what is the next step for WCC in Liberia? Um, you know, there's more to do. There's more to do. And he's empowered us to do it. And he's given us the spirit for that. So friends, let's close verse 50, 51, 52. Let's close with this uh, powerful gospel in verse 53, you know, and then he blessed them. And then he blessed them. And, and don't we all need that blessing, you know, of Jesus tonight? It reminds me of the Aaronic blessing in the Old Testament. And the blessing, of course, of John chapter 20, verse 29. Um, you know, Thomas saw and believed he, he, on the next appearance of Jesus to the upper room. He's, uh, you know, he looked at Jesus' nail holes and at the, 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 uh, the hole in his side from the spear. And, and he believed. And Jesus said, blessed are those who have brothers and sisters, you're blessed and you've believed because the powerful testimony of the word of God, which is all true and the Holy spirit ministering to you and Jesus Christ who sits with you when you open his word and he's instructing you word for word in it. How much more blessing can there be? Than, than the presence of, of Jesus Christ and the spirit, you know, with us and that blessing you who have not seen with physical eyes, the Lord Jesus, that day is coming. And then verse 51, he was taken up into heaven, just like that. He was taken up and verse 52, there's all kinds of responses as we close the book. Let's pick them out. Starting in verse 52, the response to this ascension of Christ and his departure. Oh, poor pitiful me will never make it. No, what, what, number one, oh, work glory, hallelujah, not, oh, poor pitiful me, we don't have Jesus anymore, we're really sunk, he's left, and oh, we don't know what to do as a church, we don't know what to do, no, 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 worship, that's how the spirit had stirred in their hearts, and opened their eyes, the word of God, number two, what they do next, yeah, the obedience. They return to Jerusalem. Number three, how? Oh, oh, may our joy be full. Number four, verse 53. Yeah, where? In the temple. And number five. Now, you want to see a cool bookend? How did the book of Luke start? Where did it start? The book of Luke. Where did it start? Oh, who? And how? Who? You. Oh, I have to go look. <laughs> but you knew. Everybody, where did the book of Luke start? Who? And how? I, I guess if you look to Luke chapter one, you'll find out. Go ahead. Somebody. Somebody. Yeah. How does the whole recording of Luke start? With whom and where? I and as ministers of the word, Theophilus. Keep going. That you can um, keep going. Certainty Jump further. John the Baptist, John the now we're getting there. How does the story start? With whom? Well, the angel yeah. telling Mary. That, uh, no, no, we're not. We're not Mary there. Now we're getting somewhere. Who is he and where is he? He's a priest, and where is he? In the temple. The book of Luke starts in the temple with an old man who has a simple Old Testament faith, who is serving God and in the temple, and he gets a divine visitation. And the book ends in the temple with disciples who life is exalted and surrendered to Jesus. And... 
the book closes open-ended. What are you going to do with your life? It really is an open-ended clo- a close. Are, are, are you going to devote your life, you know, to the worship of God and the witness of Jesus? See? Now, you know, the book of Acts is the sequel, of course. We understand that. The book of Acts is the sequel. And we find out what did they do next, right? And that's where, you know, Acts begins and the coming of the Holy Spirit and, and the witness that turned the world upside down. And, and may God do such a thing in these latter days here. Yeah. So, yeah, God's plan continues in the temple. And uh, interesting enough, it's in the temple of you. You're, you are the temple of the risen Christ, are you not? not? Not a given building, but you, Christ dwelling in you, Christ dwelling in me that we would be the witness of Jesus Christ in these latter days to a world that is just clueless and uh, fast on a road uh, departing from God. So um, the mission has been handed down to us. We'd make it as an application and you can read the book of Luke uh, of Acts, of course, to find the sequel of the whole thing and, and uh, may the praise of God keep going on and continuing. Well, we got just a couple of seconds to do part four. I, I just love to, Hear your thoughts as we review uh, part four, then uh, your favorite text in Luke. Go ahead. Yeah, your favorite text from our whole study. Seven, verse 23. Okay, which is, read. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account Great, thanks. Someone else, your favorite text of Luke? From our nine months, please. 923. 923. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Wow. Powerful. Excellent. Someone else, your favorite text from our nine months of study? I'm giving taxes. I like to be transfiguration. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Anyone else? Favorite part? Okay, let's pick the second one. How have I grown through this study? And that's not G R O A N. <laughs> yeah. How have I grown? Anybody with a testimony, please? I have to say that it gave me a better understanding of the suffering that Jesus had mm. to forgive me for my sins and how it allowed me to be more grateful for that forgiveness and. Appreciate it, Mama. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? How have you grown? Please. Give me a greater appreciation for the authorship of the scriptures of Holy One. Oh, excellent. Oof. Excellent. Yep. I can read it every day. I mean, I read it for quite a few years. And I'm going through it again. It's Still amazing, man. you know. It, it, that would get old. It's new every day. <laughs> Hallelujah! It's new every day. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're sitting and feasting with Jesus at the table, He keeps opening your eyes to something new you haven't seen in an old verse. He'll just keep making it new. That's that's the glory of a believer who's minister, uh, fellowshipping with Jesus genuinely, right? Um, anyone else on how you've grown in the in the study in nine months? Otherwise, I'll pick the third one. Your summer scripture plan is what? What, what are you going to do for scripture this summer? What are you going to do? Are you? Anyone else? Cool. What are you going to do? What's your plan? Because, of course, if, if we're, we're not meeting here, we're doing the book study this summer, we're not meeting with a biblical book. But if, if, we, if we close the Bibles for the next three months, we might be a little bit in trouble. Anybody have a plan for the summer, please? Just read more of the Old Testament. Are you? Okay. Do you have a starting spot? Right at the beginning. All right. <laughs> yep. Well, talking about the chronological Bible, I have one I read it years ago, but that's further beyond. Oh. Start reading it. Oh, okay. All right. Please. Go work through James and memorize it. Cool. Powerful. Yes. Go. Do it. Do yes. Do it. Commit it. Yeah. 
you know, and pray, pray that, you know, we can grow in that discipline. Yes. Pray for her to do that. Or because I listened to someone speak on it. Okay. Memorizing scripture. All right. And she said that there will become a day soon that you will not have this. Mm. And you need something. Yeah. You need to you, memorize. Yeah. You need, you need it here. And James to me is the best one. Okay. Memorize. Powerful. Thank you. To mm. go through hard times. Thank you. Yep. Please. You know, um, our youngest son graduated yeah. from Wheaton College. And he had, that was one of the requirements. He had to memorize the book of James. Okay. Graduated. Yeah. So. All right. Thankful. Add it to your list. I mean, that'd be a great bucket list. Please. I, I read through something every night, and I just started Micah as well. I've been going through the, the, the lesser things that you don't see all the time. Okay. I, I don't know if I'll do them all in order, or okay. I just something and I go, well, I, I know more about that one. I'm going to skip to something I don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Good. Well, yeah, I commit you to, you know, a summer of, of sitting and feasting with Jesus, right? Because we'll, we'll not be done in drawing closer to him until he returns. We'll not be done. What are you going to have? And now, for the revelation. Yeah. After prayer first. <laughs> and the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace both now and forevermore. Amen.